And so without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and hop into the, the questions and answers, or at least the questions. I can't promise answers, <laughs> but y'all can bring the questions. So uh, yeah, make your way over here if you got a question. And it looks like we have someone amazing and brave to kick us off. So mm -hmm. introduce yourself and um, we'll say hi. Uh, hi, my name is Milana Tap. I'm from Serbia and I'm here uh, on behalf of Make Teams. So ah. I'm from documentation team and we started contributing, well, collaborating uh, together with other teams like learn and training teams because we have, yeah, uh, we have needs for the same infrastructure, but there is no infrastructure. And uh, we also started uh, collaborating with hosting team mm -hmm. on new handbook that will happen at Vast uh, Administration. And we really want to collaborate with core team mm -hmm. to have dedicated documentarian for every developer so we document everything mm -hmm. while it's being developed so we don't ever again ship code that is not fully documented. Mm -hmm. Now my question is, because we are doing this all in private messages and that's not mm -hmm. the way for open source, mm -hmm. can we have some you know, support from meta team or something mm -hmm. uh, to make this uh, to create the infrastructure for, for collaborating between teams. Hmm. So would that be like a, a channel on the Slack or a new P2? Well, what no, no, not there? just that, you know, uh, when you start with just a, a release, mm -hmm. there are changes and now we from documentation, we document that, but mm -hmm. there has to be some waterfall that information goes to learn team and uh, support mm -hmm. team and uh, training. So if we could have some system where hmm. uh, it, it kind of expects us to work together, not mm -hmm. to be just separate team. I mean, we can discuss this tomorrow at Contributor Day to see how we yeah. can do it. We just know that we need to do it. Yeah, the good news, all the changes are happening in, um, in source control and so everything is there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe what could be a good role um, is someone to keep an eye on that. Yeah. And do like a notification. So. Uh, that could be even more than a new forum. It might just be like a new uh, way for people to contribute. Yeah, that um, would be also great. That's yeah. that's the way that I try to keep up with things as well. I keep an eye okay. on like the GitHub issues and, and the change sets. I used to read every single one, but not so much anymore. <laughs> but I would say that if you if you want to know what's coming, reading the change sets, and we have pretty good commit messages now, is by far and away the best way uh, to do it. But I could see where perhaps if that's um, if that might be too technical for someone who else yeah. who wants to contribute otherwise, someone to translate that um, could be helpful. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank <laughs> so, uh, non-serious question followed up by a serious question. Sure. So, welcome back. Uh, in honor of you being back in San Diego, are you going to do Irish car bombs again tonight? <laughs> I I don't remember the last time doing them. So they must have worked. Uh, <laughs> That was our, our first WordCamp here in San Diego, 2011. So, ah. this, and there was photographic evidence of that. <laughs> I seem I seem to recall taking photos of you behind the bar. <laughs> you know, as as I enter my late 30s, hangovers seem to last longer. So I drink a lot less. <laughs> cool. So, um, so a, a little bit more serious of a question is, um, you know, recently I had I had uh, as a developer work on a, a project on WordPress.com, mm -hmm. and. They didn't want to move, <laughs> despite my urging, mm -hmm. um, and you know I ended up uh, you know having to really go through the process of working on there, mm -hmm. and seeing some real you know like struggling to work through mm -hmm. being on .com and some limitations that are on there. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a great experience mm -hmm. uh, as a developer, and um, like <laughs> I, <laughs> I've used some very strong language about it before, but <laughs> like it was very poor experience as a mm -hmm. developer, like working on the platform. Mm -hmm. and, and getting anything done. Like as uh, I was created as an admin, as mm -hmm. a user, I couldn't install plugins or themes. Huh. Um, you know, they had their, um, their main account, which um, I guess was what was paying for their premium service. Mm -hmm. I had to be logged in as them to be able to install or edit plugins, that sort of thing. Hmm. So um, my question is, what are we doing about .com? This is the thing that really drives 
you know the you know this what we're what we're doing here right this like really pays for all that you know like what where, well, some, where some of it not most of it <laughs> i'm sorry yeah so but i mean that's i mean the majority of like you know the the user uh base that we have as wordpress right, right. is is comes from the dot com so um yeah. Pro probably it'd be good to talk about a little bit of the history and then what's some of the latest stuff that maybe okay. you haven't seen yet yeah yeah absolutely so, yeah, i'm just kind of curious we're, we're, as... we're, 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 i feel like we're being overlapped by squarespace and wix these days right mm. like onboarding user experience is like you know taking significant leaps above and beyond what wordpress.com i think has now yeah and, and i'm kind of concerned that some of the dip in user base that we've experienced in the last year or so is kind of a direct result of that. Mm. These public companies that have the money, that have the background, throw all kinds of stuff at that. Like we have almost an infinite supply of, you know, like contributors mm -hmm. uh, as, as being an open source platform. Yeah. And I, I think that what's missing is a little bit of is the vision. And maybe you can talk a little bit about maybe there is some upcoming vision to that. Yeah, originally WordPress dot com started as, like you said, a way to onboard brand new people. Right. And it was a big multi-site instance. Right. Um, so uh, there were a lot of plugins and things built in, but you couldn't modify the code or install your own or things like that. Um, what changed is on the business plan and above, um, you now it's a full, essentially like VPS type site. Mm -hmm. um, so you do get complete control over the code top to bottom, including being able to install plugins and themes. Right. It sounds like this this uh, customer might not have been on that business plan. Oh, he was. Oh, yeah, they were, yeah, okay. Yeah, was. Um, I had to be logged in as him to actually do any of that. I couldn't, even as an admin user, yeah. I couldn't do that, which is... They might have set you as the wrong role, because you should be able to. Could and be. the thing that just launched, I want to say last week, is now full SSH and WP CLI access. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, it is something we've been, a lot of people don't know about this yet, mm -hmm. but um, definitely we've been hearing from a lot of developers and we want to make it a developer friendly place. Right. We also launched a pricing change that we ended up rolling back that brought the full um, kind of hosting access to basically every plan and mm -hmm. lower the price. And that ended up being a huge disaster for some reason. <laughs> so we, we reverted back to the old plans. Sure. Um, but yeah, there's uh, new things launching there. I would say developer focus is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you haven't yet, check out the, um, the SSH and, uh, and WPCLI access. Okay. And of course, what's happening in the back end that is unusual there is um, actually multi data center failover and also super high performance, including mm -hmm. high frequency CPUs and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So you can actually run like very advanced uh, LMS sites or WooCommerce sites or other things on it. So if you haven't checked it out recently, uh, check it out again. Okay. And in fact, that platform behind it is uh, WP Cloud, WP.Cloud, mm -hmm. which is now being used by a few other folks like Pressable, GridPane, some other hosts are starting to license that as well. Right. Um, because yeah. it is one of the highest performance. Yeah, I was so, just talking to Patrick this, yeah, this oh, afternoon. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, but sorry you had a bad experience there. And <laughs> definitely, I would say right in on the, the admin thing, mm -hmm. because maybe that's a bug. Okay. But the other things like, the SSH hashtags just launched. So okay. <laughs> check that out again. Okay. Yeah, and thank cool. you for the question. Right. Yeah, good to see you again. Yep. Hey, uh, my name is James. I'm with PMC. Mm -hmm. And my question is if you could wave a magic wand mm -hmm. and make a WordPress problem that seems otherwise insurmountable just disappear overnight, huh. what, would you, uh, what would you choose? Hmm. I'll pick two, because one means? really drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> Y'all know the capital IDs in the, <laughs> in the database tables? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> what were we thinking? Uh, I think that goes all the way back to the B2 days. So that, um, that would be one I would change. And we probably can change at some point. We just need to migrate <laughs> some things. I think uh, none of people actually directly create a database, so we could do that. Um, I guess I'm going to wave this magic wand three times. <laughs> You're the boss. Uh, You're in charge. The second one, and I think there is some solutions for this, um, but you know, I've been thinking a lot about um, projects that really build for the long term hmm. and th think not just in years but decades. And of course, open source has some of the best ones of these. And one I've been kind of particularly enamored with recently is actually SQLite. Um, as you know, they, they try to think about their data formats, um, you know, being accessible for decades to come, like a, a really safe data storage format for rich data. And so something a little more native in terms of supporting SQLite, I think actually would pair very well with WordPress's thoughts on longevity and permalinks and everything like that that we try to support. 
And third thing I would say, which you know came up in a lot of questions, particularly in Europe and other places, is um, if we could help people onboard better uh, to get involved with the community. And I think particularly with the um, loss of a lot of meetups during COVID, they're now starting to catch back up. And I know there's actually going to be some focus on that at Contributor Day tomorrow. By the way, who's sticking around for Contributor Day? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, that's great. I think, was it, was it Porto? We actually ran out of food and chairs and stuff because <laughs> we had so many more people at Contributor Day. Um, so I, I think you know, the best way to get involved with the WordPress community is typically sitting down at a laptop with someone else who's already involved and like um, kind of walking through it and learning and uh, learning together. And so meetups, Contributor Day is coming back and everything um, is fantastic. I would love to get better at doing that in a distributed fashion. So I think we're, we're pretty good at it if you're in person or able to come physically to a contributor day. But as y'all know, like we had to cut the, cap the tickets quite lower. This is, I think, the smallest WordCamp US since a um, oh, wow. while. I kind of love it because this feels like the old days. <laughs> Not quite 2002. That one would have been much smaller. Um, a lot of people don't know, but the very first ever um, WordCamp was organized with only like a few weeks of notice. And we did it at the Swedish American Music Hall in, um, in San Francisco. Uh, I just saw an amazing documentary as well called um, We Are As Gods, which is uh, about Stuart Brand, who is this amazing character who founded the whole Earth Catalog, which of course inspired Steve Jobs. And um, they were going to some of the original, I think he also organized the very first ever hacker conference, kind of like around the Homebrew Computer Club and everything like that. And in the documentary, they had pictures of this first conference and gosh, if you wouldn't believe it, it was at the Swedish American Music Hall. <laughs> I was like, wait, I recognize that weird place. <laughs> um, so that in-person is helping, but I would love for us to, whether that's online pairing or you know, uh, online meeting times that are in different time zones and things, to make it easy for the folks who, for whatever reason, aren't able to come to a WordCamp or a meetup, um, get involved. Because that's, I think, part of the power of, of our online community as well. Time awesome. to wake up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, can I help him with a mic there? Yeah. Got it. Michelle Frechette with Stellar WP at Liquid Web and Post Status. So, Whoa. <laughs> yes. My Busiest question, woman in WordPress. What's that? Busiest woman in WordPress. I, maybe. Merger. <laughs> You've met Josefa, right? <laughs> okay. Mergers and acquisitions have been a hot topic in the last few years. What are your thoughts about this for the WordPress ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Why or why not? Hmm. Um, I think mergers and acquisitions are value neutral in and of themselves, and it's more about what happens afterwards. So I think it's natural that particularly when we enter moments of economic uncertainty, which we've certainly had a lot of in the past few years and might be going into more of now, um, or when markets are super hot, like they kind of were a year ago, uh, for there to be some consolidation or folks that particularly have a lot of equity value in their stock to use that to, um, to join up. And um, I'll also say that having done over like 25 of those, <laughs> been on both sides of, of a lot of those, including as an investor, um, they, they're tough to do right. And, um, one thing that I actually see helping uh, in the WordPress community versus acquisitions that happen in more general technology is um, there's so much philosophical alignment across a lot of the organization in the WordPress community, including very many of them being distributed or having a strong like distributed aspect to them. And so, of course, like having the open source ethos. So um, I feel like the WordPress organizations are really good influences on each other. And uh, certainly at Automatic, we've had a lot of inspiration from you know some of the cool things that other organizations do including around contributor days or how they give back or all sorts of things and because there's so much sharing and blogging about it <laughs> there's just a lot of cross-pollination which i like um, where they're tough is just integrating different cultures are hard um, sometimes uh, founders might leave after an acquisition or just there might be sort of like an organ rejection of the, the cultures of a new organization and old organization um, one way we think about it is that when we buy a company, we're hoping to both influence them and be influenced by them. So 
automatic itself is kind of like a different organism once the cultures merge. And depending on the size of, of what's joining, um, that might both take a while or be a b really big change. Like uh, for us, one of the most, the largest ones in terms of people is uh, Tumblr, which is about, I think, 200 people, 180 people when we bought it. Yeah. So that has uh, been an interesting process. I would encourage you know, folks who, who work on acquisitions or do them in the space to think about the, uh, the day that deal is signed as the halfway point, not the finish point. Because mm -hmm. however much work you did getting to that uh, and working together is I think you need at least that much on the other side to really intentionally integrate the cultures and onboard people well. And also just make sure there's not something um, you know, kind of lost in the bureaucracy <laughs> that's happening around like expense policies or uh, vacation resetting or just all the kind of logistics. Um, that sometimes we can forget about when those things happen. So well, I'd love you to have you on post data so we can talk about it more. <laughs> I'm happy to, always happy to join the podcast of the different WordPress uh, publications. Awesome. And thank you again for the question. My pleasure. <laughs>
if there could be an interesting project to create kind of a parallel API driven uh, version of it that was designed to perhaps have um, like hide some of that more advanced functionality for the everyday use case. Again, particularly if you were doing like something more like blogging on it versus right. the full layout yeah, stuff. Right. And so you could access that more complex interface if you needed to do that particular task. But for the everyday, there could be a simpler one. So that's already possible with mm -hmm. the APIs. Um, but I think actually a pretty interesting uh, approach for like the accessibility team or something um, because we now have APIs for pretty much everything. So you could actually create a, a completely parallel WP admin with not that much overhead. That could be a much simpler markup or something. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Bonjour. Konnichiwa. Uh, <laughs> Megan from Canada here. Uh, Howdy. Howdy. Multilingual in WordPress. It's always <laughs> been the last priority, unfortunately. Not the last. Well, I'll, so in the Gutenberg uh, roadmap that we know, it's actually number four, and that's the last on the list. <laughs> Over 60% of people well, speak more than one. That's because we haven't announced five or six yet. <laughs> well, I'm patient. I'll wait. Over 60% of people in the world speak more than one language. Yeah. Over 25% speak three or more. Wow. Like, I'm curious as to why it's always been a lower priority and mm -hmm. what we can do specifically, what you think personally, this has not been a higher priority, what barriers do you see that we can start working towards, yeah. and what can we do in the next three releases to finally let WordPress democratize language? Mm. Yeah, this one comes up. <laughs> Although I think this is one of the first times I've gotten it at WordCamp US. Usually I get this question at WordCamp Europe. <laughs> For perhaps obvious I took reasons. a long flight to get here to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you come in from, by the way? Uh, Ottawa, Canada. Ah. WordCamp 2023. Also, we're going to plan a 20th year birthday party for WordPress. I think everyone else should too. Maybe. Oh, nice. I'm curious who came here the furthest. I met someone from Pakistan earlier. Who thinks they came in the furthest? Where, where'd you, oh, from Pakistan? Yeah. Nice. How about over there? Wait, Australia? Whoa. Although in flight time, I think you said 30 hours, right? Of travel. That, that'll do it. And wh where, how about in the back? Where from? Karachi, Pakistan. Karachi, Pakistan, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a long one. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, so there's a few questions in there. Um, one, multilingual in WordPress today. And two, why is it further down in the Gutenberg roadmap? So I'll try to address those separately. Um, Multilingual today is obviously not in core, but the good news is there are a number of pretty good plugins for it. And so many, many WordPress sites are multi or run in a multilingual fat. Um, actually, who here runs uh, WordPress in more than one language? That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, that looked like about a 5 or 10%. And we're in WordCamp US, so I'm sure it'd be much higher uh, if we had asked that same question in WordCamp Europe or one of the international WordCamps. Um, so very possible. And I was, actually, it, these plugins are pretty good. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to endorse a specific one. I used one. to work at one. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> but they still cost money, and that's not the democracy we're trying to build. And some of the, and most of them have free versions, and then some of them have paid upgrades and other things. Um, it is tricky, particularly the data model for it. So that brings us to why it is later in the Gutenberg roadmap. And just do a quick refresher. Um, version, uh, sort of phase one of Gutenberg was blocks, sort of the post editor. Phase two, which we're in right now, is taking those blocks and allowing you to edit the whole site. So that's what we're now calling the site editor. We're moving away from the full site editing term and probably going to call it site editor. Um, phase three is workflow and collaboration, uh, which there's a little bit of a tension earlier because there's actually a lot of folks who want to start that right now. And uh, I'm actually trying to pump the brakes a little bit because I really want to get our site editing to a point of, um, of excellence and accessibility before we move on. Um, <laughs> and then fourth is the multilingual. So, and that's the only four of the phases that we've announced so far. Um, one of the reasons I really wanted to create the building blocks, sometimes literally, uh, before we got to multilingual, is because to me one of the big parts of creating a, a really great multilingual experience is that collaboration and workflow. So when content is created in one language, how does that then flow to the other languages? What does that look like? Um, and so having some 
ability to have some different roles and workflows built into WordPress, I think is going to be really key for doing that well. The other thing and why multilingual is going to be, I think, tricky to uh, address in core, if you notice a lot of the WordPress plugins for it actually use different kind of models of the data. And some use other tables, some use the post table, but regardless of how they work, it's, um, it's very tricky because you move to kind of a one-to-one -one relationship between like a page and a post or, or the, the content there to almost like a many-to-many. And there's so many different workflows. Like some sites want every single page translated, and some might want a subset. Or some might want how switching works, you know, whether that's URL-based, subdomain-based, cookie-based. You know, there's so many different ways uh, to address it. Do you want um, the same slugs, which is kind of what's in the URL for all of them? Um, so like slash contact, and then you know, just a content is uh, translated? Or do you want a way to map, like it's contact in English and Someone tell me that in another language. <laughs> a different word, right, would be, would be in the URL. Uh, so that kind of many-to-many -many approach is honestly um, going to add a tremendous amount of complexity to WordPress. And I'm actually still not 100% whether we should do more of a core plugin for it that's officially supported and, and created by, by folks, but maybe not actually distributed with core WordPress, kind of like Gutenberg was in the beginning, um, or whether it should actually be in core, just because it... Um, creates that. But the number one thing I, I do want to figure out there is the data model, because then much like page building plugins can all now use core Word, WordPress blocks, and that's kind of a new standard versus having like a different way to do blocks across the different page builders, whether you're on Beaver Builder or Divi or you know, whatever. Um, if we could make it so um, all the multilingual plugins were using kind of common data structure, I think that would be much easier for other plugins than to integrate with them. But I don't know what that right data structure is yet. And um, I don't think we have enough folks to work on that simultaneously with these other phases. So uh, it is really kind of a matter of focus. And it drives me crazy because I get this question every single time. <laughs> Seems natural that we want to grow our market share and this is the way other softwares make it a little easier. Yeah. Anyway, thank well, you. I don't know if they, it's possible. I haven't seen also an implementation that does it in a super great user way yet either. Um, so that would also be something like if any of you have, you know, whether it's another CMS entirely or one of the plugins for WordPress that you think like really nails the user experience, I would love to spend some more time with that because the complexity of this mini to mini and how the workflows work, how the URLs work, everything like that. Um, it appears I haven't seen like a perfect implementation. It's more like a series of trade-offs or implementing a subset of it. Mm. So. I will follow up with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Matt. My name is Birgit Pauli Haag, and I have a question about tomorrow is the contributor day. Yeah. And um, if you stay, and I don't know if you do, but what would be the favorite, the most favorite thing for you at contributor day to oh. work on? Oh, I, I believe. By the way, is it that we have seventeen of the twenty-one make teams represented as well? Oh, cool. I'll repeat that. So she said that there'll be some representatives online as well there. So there'll actually be 20 of the 21 teams. Which team did make it? Plugins. Plugins. Oh. <laughs> no, it's okay. Plugins aren't that important, right? <laughs> We've got a lot of them already. Oh, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, hmm. uh, you know, something that I've actually really enjoyed at, at previous ones is uh, there's so much on WordPress.org that I think is, you know, we just redesigned the homepage and a few other things. Um, it feels like there's a lot of lift from relatively simple changes, whether that's more CSS or just copy-based, um, that could really improve uh, both the core main WordPress.org site. And I also think a lot about the Rosetta sites. You know, again, um, being relatively monolingual, at least for natural languages, um, I don't know. Probably some folks in here could say, like, on the es.wordpress.org or one of these other ones, how good of a job are we doing? And both having compelling copy that's you know relevant, that's maybe synced up with the, what we learned to be best on the main site, and um, it's kind of a version of the last question. Actually, <laughs> what's the workflow for propagating those changes in different directions? And, or is there more that we can do, particularly on the Rosetta sites, which is our international subdomains, um, to be more compelling and relevant for that market? So that would probably be my pick. Uh, thank uh, you. Thank you.
And looking forward to seeing lots of y'all there tomorrow as well. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Philip Levine from South Florida Web Advisors. I got a quick question. Many of the people in the room, I get, use block editor. That's the direction of things mm -hmm. are going in. But there's a lot of folks who are still using classic editor, still using mm -hmm. page builders. Whenever I do a new install, it's a pain that I got to remember to go in and install classic editor or classic mm. widgets. Could there be a toggle for during the install to say install in classic mode and and throw those plugins in automatically and that way you're not having to do it every time? There could be, but <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. No, it's okay. No. Let, let me give a slightly longer answer there, which is that, um, you know, we definitely are going to, you know, we actually, I think it's extended how long we're supporting the, the classic editor plugin and everything like that. Technically, it's, it's not too hard to keep that going for a while because we still need to have kind of tiny MC support and other things kind of embedded within Gutenberg. We do have a classic block in Gutenberg as one example that provides the legacy support. So if you open a post that was created before um, Gutenberg existed, you can still edit it and convert it to blocks if you want to really simply. Um, but very much so. Uh, the preponderance of new development in WordPress is, is really focused on the block editor. And so any effort that we could put towards adding that toggle or something, we'd rather put into making it so you don't want the toggle anymore. <laughs> and someday, it sounds like that day is not yet, but that, you know, that won't be the first plugin you install on things. And more and more, we want users uh, to also be demanding that because they want a functionality of a block or an integration with a plugin which primarily operates through blocks because it just allows, um, such a more common user interface to what could be very, very advanced functionality. So um, all the new developments going into that, and think of Classic as just like a stopgap. So if you're, if you're still bidding sites with Classic in 2022, like see how you can maybe minimize that or, or migrate the users, spend an hour with them to teach them how the new stuff works, because it's really the future of WordPress. So thank you for the question. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you doing? I have a Good. quick question. You may not have a quick answer, but um, I'm William Jackson, representing my wife, Aida, and we're real interested in knowing, we've been teaching about the metaverse and onboarding people and applying it to a business aspect as well. We wanted to get your idea of how the metaverse and its growth and immersive, and immersive um, communities and societies, hmm. have you taken that into account of how you can apply it or... Uh, work with WordPress or in some fashion? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> so, so we're teachers, so we always try to ask good questions. <laughs> it's interesting because, um, you know, operating and developing connections online mm -hmm. uh, has really been my entire adult life, even before I was an adult. Right. And it was so powerful to me from a very young age be able to participate in online communities, like going back to even like BBSs and IRC and everything mm -hmm. like that, where uh, my physical identity or age or appearance or anything mm -hmm. um, wasn't a barrier to connecting with folks. Right. Um, particularly, I was pretty young. My voice was like three octaves higher. <laughs> if you met me in person, you wouldn't take me seriously. Mm -hmm. Like I'd walk into Best Buy to, you know, I saved up money to buy a camera and they wouldn't even talk to me and stuff like that. But then online, you know, I had my usernames, photo map, before that it was, I think, Illusion or something, you know, my hacker names. And the, mm -hmm. it was fun to be on the forums and learn about right. whatever it was, from BBSs to uh, mm -hmm. phone freaking or whatever it was that was right. uh, kind of what I got into in my youth. And then, of course, um, you know, a lot of participation in forums and getting involved with open source, mm -hmm. which is still one of the things I was gladdest to this day, right. things I was so glad to stumble across right. in my life and is something I hope to be the rest of my life. So the element of the, what's now called the metaverse of like mm -hmm. being able to put on and off online identities and participate mm -hmm. more on the basis of your contributions or your avatar, what, however you choose to present yourself online, I think is like one of the best things about the internet. And, um, and very cool that the WordPress community is so good at translating that into person, where it, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this already, but like very much a community where people don't judge a book by the cover. And um, it's great, you know, 
every WordPress event, you'll right. see folks from tons of different backgrounds, ages, everything. Like it's like, doesn't matter. We're all here combined by like a similar love of open source, WordPress and everything like that. And, and that's what I think one of the best parts. Yeah. Particularly, you know, a lot of the recent conversation around metaverse is, is centered and pushed by right, Facebook now meta mm -hmm. and very much around their investments in VR, right. which is uh, not insignificant. I think they're spending like five, ten billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, and the hardware is getting better, better right. much faster. And, you know, in theory, like Apple's going to come out with a new uh, headset or there right. might be some AR type things. And um, if that technology was to follow a similar curve that mm -hmm. cell phones have over the past, what's now 15 years since mm -hmm. the iPhone was introduced, and I guess even prior to that with like right. rim devices and handsprings and stuff, um, I could see mm -hmm. five or 10 years from now, maybe a lot of us wearing these things in the audience. Um, okay. I would certainly love something that would like remind me of someone's name or something <laughs> when I met them or like some sort of scanner like that would be, be kind of cool and a lot of y'all wearing glasses already so if the technology got to a point where it could be embedded in a glass um, that's pretty cool and then hopefully we don't have to wear masks then so they won't fog up so much <laughs> but my personal experience is that screens are still really good mm -hmm. and so I I've enjoyed VR for example or the headsets for like gaming or right. just having fun but I think it would be hard for me to imagine wearing one of these mm -hmm. for the amount that I'm on a computer all day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, having a screen that you can put in your pocket, take right. out, look at, show people, share really easily, right. um, is still pretty great. Uh, so I'm not actually convinced that the sort of VR use cases mm -hmm. um, are going to be as ubiquitous as right. the more screen ones. Um, unless there was some sort of breakthrough in technology that is just like impossible to imagine for at least for me yet. Right. I'm sure in the, in the depths of Apple or Meta, they have some, some yeah. prototypes there that are pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, I'll say that games, forums, mm. there's so many online communities that are, I think, fulfilling all the promise of what Meta mm. is saying could happen. So if right. that is appealing to anyone, I'd encourage them to like, spend some more time on some of these right. online communities that exist, including like the Roblox and Minecrafts of the world right. that create like really rich worlds. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, because um, we're seeing more and more conferences reaching out to us to, to see our ideas and opinions of how, how to integrate people into conferences like this mm. into the metaverse and, you know, people come in as avatars. So we just wanted to kind of get your, your, your perspective of the way it's going to go and how it's happening so we can kind of guide what we're doing and, and teaching. So thank you. Appreciate thank it. you. All right. Thank you. And just to follow up there, maybe that could be a fun like WordCamp. Uh, I definitely, you know, now that we can come in person, it, it wasn't as not as interesting. But during COVID, I definitely went to a few of those online conferences, and the software advanced pretty quickly. There was even an online Burning Man one year. Um, that uh, I think there were actually multiple ones you could access through different um, different platforms, and it was interesting. Uh, not as good as the real verse, <laughs> but um, coming up, and uh, but still pretty neat. So, was that? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Oh, okay, cool. Um, how about lightning rounds? Try to get through the rest. Okay. Hard stuff. Oh, hard stuff. What time? Oh, okay. So, I'll try to answer short answers. So, but uh, we'll try to get through these five, and if not, we'll have to stop right at the five forty-five. So. Sure. Clarifying on a question. Hi, I'm Courtney Robertson from GoDaddy Pro. At WordCamp Europe, I asked about the um, translation on learn.wordpress.org. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to clarify that question was more around courses. We do have ways of mm -hmm. storing some of the other languages, but courses are using Sensei Pro. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure on the time frame of multilingual, mm -hmm. and I would like to see an alternative before we wait that long. Yeah to make languages more available. And um, if that means a plugin or a Rosetta site or something to maintain that, I'd like to see that get unblocked. And then um, related to that, you and I had a conversation in Slack around the data of how many views or what the access is mm -hmm. on Learn. Mm -hmm. And as we know on .org, gathering too much data is a little bit tricky because people don't like a whole lot of sure. data being gathered, especially on an open source site. Mm -hmm. um, it would be helpful. So those are areas that I'm not sure if we can get unblocked, but it would be really nice too. I think we could, yeah. 
Okay. So we can continue that on, on the .org stack, but I know we do run like Google Analytics in some places. And we've, we've shared that with different contributors. Okay. So that shouldn't be too hard. And I do think we do have some other language courses on Learn as well. So it's a little bit of a manual process now, but it is, it is already happening. Right. Oh. And do you have an ETA on overhauling make, the main make.wordpress.org page I, itself? I don't think currently on the roadmap. So perhaps okay. that's something that people could take a look at tomorrow. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right, lightning round. I'll try to, <laughs> as you can tell, I, I, I can be loquacious. So I'll try to keep these short. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Nathan uh, from Elegant Themes. Um, one of those weird people that got into WordPress for blogging and still does it to this day. Cool. So, <laughs> if anybody remembers uh, way back in the day, like WP Mods, <laughs> I wrote for them. Wow. Um, and so I fell in love with WordPress as a blogging platform. It's been my profession for like 10, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I go to WordCamps, or I, I especially was surprised at WordCamp for publishers that it wasn't actually for people like blogging, it was like for news organizations. <laughs> so, um, uh, you seem to be at a very interesting position right now as like the, the company um, that acquired Tumblr, mm -hmm. um, that reinvented the editor within WordPress uh, for Gutenberg. Um, we are kind of seeing a, a potential for new ways to revolutionize blogging itself mm -hmm. as, a, as a medium and what's possible there. As someone at the nexus of all that, how, what do you see as the future of blogging? Ooh. Um, short answer. Short answer. Um, yeah. So a quick stat, uh, half the people coming to WordPress.com are actually blogging and bloggers. And we're seeing a ton of activity there. Things I'm most excited to work on, one, like as I mentioned before, we're switching Tumblr to be WordPress powered. That's so I think that could provide a really nice in, uh, sort of like gateway into the WordPress world. And I'm sure, I hope it's future WordCamps they'll be like, because Tumblr is a younger audience, people who started on Tumblr and then now are like at work camps, writing plugins, things like that. I think that'd be really cool. And um, things that we're working on right now, particularly the re remainder of the year, that some teams focused on are the reader. So, because I think, you know, since Google Reader has been gone, there hasn't been a good way to follow other blogs. And commenting, I feel like commenting um, is uh, there's not good interactions for follow-up. So I think both of those can help reinvigorate because, of course, comments are the best part of blogging. And uh, so keep an eye on for some improvements there, both in Jetpack and WordPress.com on its way. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. Hello, uh, David Yard from Orlando. Um, first, I want to thank you for the awesome photo that you took of me and John Maida back at a random <laughs> obscure meetup where I was more nervous than anything else. Um, and also, you said people. Um, Thank you for having us speakers here who are challenged by the attendees to be better and do more cool stuff. Um, my question is, uh, after talking to a few people here, um, it kind of seems that WordPress has a marketing problem mm. where it is an amazing platform. We know the power of it, um, but really and truly only developers are kind of like welcome at the table. Mm. Um, so as designers, as UX people, as brand strategists, we're just kind of like, yeah, WordPress is great, you should get it, and then hopefully pass you off in the hands of a great developer. Or if you're mm -hmm. lucky and you find someone that is kind of like that unicorn, then so be it, right? Um, no pun intended, oh snap. Um, so how do we, uh, or what would you see as a best way for designers in the field content people to kind of come together to uh, collaborate around those more and um, not make it so technical, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is why we started Gutenberg, mm -hmm. is to try to open up the, the flexibility and power of how people are able to customize if they knew code in the past or just got good at building themes and things uh, to a much wider audience. Um, we also, there's going to be a design table tomorrow. so. Come to that if you're, or maybe you're already at it, I bet you are. <laughs> uh, I, I will say that um, one thing I hope to develop is a more culture of um, open source participation from designers. And part of that is uh, showing the impact of like user research, design, everything. And I think, at least what I hear from developers in WordPress, is they're really hungry for it. Um, because we, we might do a first version of a design, but like, uh, or the developer might do it themselves, but the feedback from like a user test or something else I find incredibly influential. So uh, I'd love to see more of that actually as a way, and if we can publish it and show, um, do that in public, I think it's actually could teach a lot of people design skills, even though they might not identify as a designer. Cool, thank you. Thank you.
all right, we might actually get through these by, <laughs> by the time they kick us out. So I don't know if the lights are going to go off or my mic will cut out. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cassandra. This is my first WordCamp. Welcome. So. <laughs> you so picked I, a good one. <laughs> yes, I only understand about half of the development conversation, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, so I actually come from the nonprofit world, mm -hmm. and I have had the privilege to learn from presenters here about some of the efforts around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to hear your thoughts about how our community, everyone, right, not just the community team, mm -hmm. um, could actively and strategically create avenues for disadvantaged communities. Mm -hmm. I've helped build relationships locally between companies and schools, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but this community is brilliant, it's loving, it's um, so focused on connecting, and I just feel like we need to be intentional about fighting for access and combating poverty. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> With the time, I'm definitely only going to be able to scratch the surface this, this one, so I apologize in advance. Um, for a longer depth into this, if you, if you didn't see earlier, there was a great talk by uh, Kami Chaos. Yes, I did. Is Kami yeah. here? Yeah. Somewhere. Uh, so that's already online on the live stream. I got to catch a bit of it and, of course, saw David Bissett's great tweets and everything about it. So, um, But I, th I think that's worth a much uh, more in-depth because it really, like you said, there's so many different avenues and places uh, to try to be more belonging as a community. Um, I will also point as well just briefly to some of the work of the WordPress Foundation, uh, the different programs that are being run, like workshops in other countries, uh, the do action type things that actually build websites for nonprofits. So it's both teaching people how to do it and helping a nonprofit in a different field have a better online presence um, as being very high impact. And I know some of the work, um, Automatic as a team uh, that builds websites for folks just for um, basically friends or, or influencers or stuff like that. And we found it being very high impact that, you know, even more than just giving money to an organization, if we were able to help them convert more visitors to their website to be donators, that had like a, a big multiplier effect. And so it was one of the big ways that we've, or one of the giving back that I've been most proud of that we've been able to do. So think about that as a way as well to support not just WordPress, people learning WordPress, but other nonprofits in the space. Helping their online presence is uh, can be very, very powerful. And most nonprofits, you contact, or if you say, like, can I help with the website, they'll be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Thank That's you. brief, but hopefully some pointers to some, some deeper discussion on it. All right. All right, bring us home. <laughs> All right. um, hi, Matt. It's Christina. And one of the things I love about WordPress, I've been working with it since 2008, is the flexibility and mm. the choices people have and the commitment to diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. Many of my clients are older, and mm. they've been using the classic editor mm. and classic widgets for a long time. And when you say just teach them the new Gutenberg, that puts a hardship on older people yeah. who've been using it for many years and are very happy with the classic editor. So. Yeah. I'm here to urge you to keep it around much longer than what you suggested so that the older community is not put in a hardship, that they have to learn something that's new and technical. So please do consider those folks. That, yeah. I think that represents one of the most difficult things about products in general because, for example, iOS, was it 16, is about to come out. So constantly operating systems, everything. We need to update if we're going to be both not just update versions for security and everything like that, but also to expand our mission of democratizing publishing. And so one thing I do worry is that the longer that people stay on the old thing, the bigger the delta is between where what they were using before and what they're going to have to learn. It's much, much easier if you're kind of on, if you're learning the latest thing, to keep rolling with that update than if, let's say, they were going to wait another five years and then try to learn whatever, you know, Gutenberg 48 <laughs> going from classic editor. So I would actually, I will go back and encourage them to make the leap now um, because that will give them the most forward compatibility with where things are going. And I actually believe that, you know, we were kind of 
early-ish to this, but if you look at every CMS now, they're using some form of block editor. And other document things are doing it. Even Google Docs is moving to have some richer blocks. So I think the concepts that you learn, uh, block editing, is actually the future of just writing and publishing on the web. And, um, and just how everything's going to work, not even just Gutenberg. And maybe they learn Gutenberg. Uh, as you all know, we're, we're relicensing the mobile version of Gutenberg to be more easily embeddable, even in commercial apps. I think Gutenberg blocks actually could wind up becoming like a wider web standard. So it won't just apply to WordPress, but perhaps even for other applications. I'd love if someday MailChimp or even Squarespace or Wix were to use Gutenberg. Um, and so it becomes more of a cross CMS standard. I think Gutenberg could actually be bigger than WordPress itself in terms of you know, being uh, usable for lots of different apps. Well, we already have it on Tumblr, actually. Gutenberg is still changing, so if yeah. you could make the transition longer, that would help, because it's hard for them to learn, and now it's changed, and they got to learn it again. So I'd, yeah. I'm, I'm eager to teach them, but I'd rather wait. And so if you could make the transition longer, that would be great. Well, we've already extended it a few years. Um, so, but Gutenberg started in, what, 2016? So it's been a while already. And, and when Classic Editor was our main editor, it would change a lot every single release as well. So there is, I, I, know, it's a, I know it's hard to learn new things, but I can't recommend anything else in, in good faith. Um, so it's, it's, I well, think it's uh, hard, but worth it. Well, just consider the hardship on them, that's all. We thank do, you. yeah, thank you. And we are now over time a little bit. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Yeah. Uh.